I know the feeling, you just have done a super hard workout, the lactate is pumping through your veins, flowing through your body, and the last thing you are is hungry. So it can take up to two to three hours before you actually start eating something, for example, with carbohydrates after your hard workout. Well, in this video, I will lay out that eating at least some carbohydrates right after you finish your workout might be a good idea to improve your recovery the next day. Because new research that just came out has demonstrated that when you delay post-exercise carbohydrate consumption, it can decrease performance the next day by 30%. That's a pretty strong claim. So let's get into the basics. Let's get into the details of this study. Hi everyone, I'm Gomar. I'm a senior scientist at ETH Zurich, based in Switzerland. And for the last decade or so, I studied and taught different aspects of exercise physiology. And now I want to bring some of that science back to you guys. Okay, let's say you start a hard workout or even a normal workout where you do thrusters, burpees, pull-ups, and so on. From the moment you start contracting your muscles, the muscles obviously need energy. And that energy is predominantly coming from ATP, the breakdown of ATP. But ATP, I call this always the energy currency of the body. It always has to stay flat or at least constant. So you have to break down chemical energy, food, to be able to resynthesize very quickly this ATP constantly, right? And obviously, where is that energy coming from? From the carbohydrates as well as the fats. And then it gets quite interesting because carbohydrates are a more energy efficient uh, energy source. Meaning, you probably have heard this before, that kind of carbohydrates are the, the super fuel for your body, for your muscle cells. And that is because per unit of oxygen, you can get more energy by burning down or breaking down carbohydrates compared to fats. That's nice. So it means that with carbohydrates, you can generate more power, more energy per time unit. But the problem is that the capacity, the storage capacity of carbohydrates is limited. Carbohydrates are stored as glycogen. Glycogen, you probably have heard about that molecule. It's simply glucose molecules strung together. So all these big chains of glucose molecules is what we call glycogen. Right? And that glycogen is stored in the liver as well as all the muscles. And if you run through the numbers, you actually don't have that much energy stored in the form of glycogen. This is for a typical male, not even an athlete, a normal person. Around 500 grams of glycogen will be sto stored in all the muscles throughout your body. 100 grams or a bit more will be stored in the liver. And then very little will be stored in the blood. Only five, five grams is constantly uh, circulating. All right? So if you think about that, one gram of glycogen or glucose is good for four kilocalories of energy. Then we're talking about 2,000 to maybe 3,000 total kilocalories that you only have from the storage of glycogen. So it's a limited energy source, but it provides a lot of energy. And this you can also beautifully see in this graph where the glycogen breakdown is plotted through time over the intensity of exercise. It means, for example, you're walking, you do for a long walk just in, in your street, not up and down, just a flat walk. Um, then you obviously will also burn a little bit of glycogen, but the predominant source will be fats. So if you look at the top arrow, the glycogen breakdown goes very slow. The slope is not very steep. But once you do higher percentages of your VO2 max, so higher intensity, obviously the breakdown, the slope of breakdown is going to steepen. And look at the left side. If you're doing, for example, a CrossFit workout or something extremely intense, then your glycogen breakdown is super, super fast. So that means that, for example, you to Fran or a double Fran or something, uh, a 15 minute MRAP, something that is very short, but very high intense, then you can actually have a, a substantial amount of glycogen breakdown because you need so much energy per time unit of your workout. That's important to understand and also important for the whole part of this video. Obviously, you can recover or resynthesize your glycogen and then it gets very interesting because the body has a very good coping mechanism to be able to recover or to resynthesize this glycogen. It means that right after exercise, once you went through all your glycogen stores and the engine has burned all the glycogen, or at least a large part, the initial recovery, 
the first 30 minutes to one hour is very fast. I will get into that, why that is so fast. And then it kind of flattens out. And then after 24 hours, in some cases, 48 hours, you should be back to normal if you have a normal high carb diet, right? So you first have this fast recovery, that's important to understand. And then this slower recovery until you get back to baseline. So why is there this fast recovery and then a slow recovery? That is because of the glucose uptake that is happening right after exercise. So obviously, when you want to store your glycogen, you're gonna need to pull the glucose that is circulating in the blood into your muscle cells, right? And this happens with a specific glucose transporter. It's called GLUT4, right? Glucose transporter 4. And these transporters is a little bit of uh, biochemistry. They're sitting inside the muscle in vesicles. And when you start exercising and when you need all the glucose to be pulled back into the muscles, then these vesicles are translocated towards the sarcolemma, to the surface of your muscle cell, and then they're able to diffuse all the glucose back into the muscle cells, exactly how it should happen, right? And these physicals, they can be triggered by two, let's say, parameters or two different ways. One is muscular contraction. So the actual contractions of the muscles, that's a very potent stimulus, also with calcium signaling it has to do, to actually attract these physicals towards the sarcolemma, towards the surface, to pull in this glucose. And then the second one we all know is going to be insulin. When blood glucose starts to increase, for example, you start eating carbohydrates, pasta, Coca-Cola, and so on, the glucose in the blood is not being five grams, but maybe a bit higher, seven, eight, nine grams, and the body doesn't want that. So it will also trigger a whole cascade, a whole signaling cascade to be able to pull these vesicles towards the sarcolemma based on insulin. And then it can all happen again and all the glucose can be stored. So this initial exercise induced GLUT4 translocation is a fast mechanism, and then the insulin takes longer longer time. So that's why you see this double sized graph. So having this as a background, you would think that if you don't eat your carbohydrates right after exercise and you only rely or predominantly rely on the insulin, right, to, to get all the glucose into the muscle cells and to resynthesize glycogen, then this whole synthesis of glycogen will actually be delayed, right? And that's exactly the hypothesis that this paper put forward in a really elegant way and they tried to do it the right way related to how they set up the study and so on. So this was a, 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 a Spanish study and one of the, the last authors is David J. Bishop. He's a very good muscle researcher. If you're interested, I put a lot of his work in the description of this video. If you, if you really like to read up a little bit more on the biochemistry of exercise, I think his work would be really good, David J. Bishop. So anyway, let's look at the study setup, the protocol. Right? It's a bit of an overloaded slide, but I will guide you through it because it's important to understand how they actually did this experiment. They had nine people, nine students. I will get to the subject characteristics a little bit later in this video, but they had nine people, just normal uh, students, and they did a super high intense interval session. They just went two minutes at 94% of their peak power output. It's not important how what it exactly is. It's just a high intensity that you barely can last for for two minutes and then they had one minute rest and they did this 10 times right so pretty brutal uh, protocol and then they had or right after the exercise they had a three hour window where they consumed carbohydrates a total of 2.4 grams per kilogram body weight so i'm weighing 85 so it would be 85 times 2.4 the total amount of grams of carbohydrates they consumed after this uh exercise protocol, which is quite a lot of carbohydrates, or the same group coming back to the lab two weeks later, so a randomized controlled trial, they didn't eat any carbohydrates or they didn't consume any glucose right after the exercise, right? That's uh, the white versus the yellow here. Then before and after they took a, a bunch of biopsies and then 24 hours after this high intensity interval session, they did another, let's say, follow-up interval session where they basically did the same thing, but literally to exhaustion, meaning that maybe they can do 10, 11, 12 intervals, but the 13th interval, they couldn't reach their power anymore. They were literally exhausted. That would be your fatiguing 
protocols. So you can think about it if you're in the CrossFit world. Uh, for example, you do an EMOM until exhaustion, until you cannot complete the reps anymore. Very similar uh, setup. So pretty cool. They took, as I said, a lot of biopsies to assess different markers in the muscle as well as performance parameters. So that's why I want to show this study because I think it's a cool study. A little bit more about the characteristics of the participants because I think it's important before we actually go into the actual uh, data. So there were students, probably like Spanish students, 24 years old, uh, normal body mass 75 uh, kilograms, so they were all males. A little bit of a, a critique, but that's that's how it is. Uh, and their peak oxygen uptake, if you if you know a little bit about exercise physiology, was moderate, 40, uh, 46 a relative. So they were just average uh, students that did this test. So it's always important to understand these were not full elite um, athletes, CrossFit athletes, cyclists, uh, or uh, and so on. Before we go to the data, I want to give a quick shout out to our new training plans that we are launching now from next week, February seventeenth. If you are watching this video before February seventeenth. You can use the code HIROX15 to get 15% off of uh, one month or three months of our HIROX programming, our brand new HIROX programming that will be using the latest evidence from sports science to craft a really well-rounded training protocols involving running, hybrid training, as well as strength training. And I think you will definitely improve your HIROX performance if you follow one of these uh, programs. We also have, as you know, a lot of functional fitness uh, specific programs. It's a great way to get fit, not to overtrain, not to overdo it, and actually progress in a normal progressive overload manner. So you can access all these programs by scanning the QR code that is popping up right now or the first link in the description of this video. It's a great way to get fit and also support the channel. Let's look at the data of this study because I thought it was very intriguing indeed. So you see here the white bars, those are the ones who got immediately carbohydrates after their training and then the red bars get the delayed carbohydrates. One thing I forgot to say when I was explaining, let's say, the study setup, the overall carbohydrate intake over those 24 hours after exercise was exactly the same between the white group and the pink-red group. That's important, right? So they ate 7 grams per kilogram body weight of carbohydrates throughout those 24 hours. So it was really, literally a delayed intake of carbohydrates and not a removal of carbohydrates or an intermittent fasting or keto diet or so on, right? It was just a delayed one. And what you can see here is the muscle glycogen. So what we then do, we take a muscle biopsy, scientists take a muscle biopsy at several time points after exercise and before exercise, and then they literally measure the amount of glycogen molecules that are sitting in that piece of muscle. And you see here that as expected, after the high intensity exercise, glycogen dropped by 36%, right? And then three hours later, it was already recovered a bit by 27% lower than baseline, and then 11% lower eight hours after exercise. And then 24 hours later, it was back to baseline. There were no significant differences between baseline and uh, 24 hours of glycogen recovery. That's interesting. And there were also no significant differences, very important, between the immediate carbohydrate group and the delayed carbohydrate group. You see in the graphs that there are some kind of differences, right, like between the white and the red bar, but these were not significant. Still, I want you to put your attention towards the last part at 24 hours after time intensity exercise. You do see that there's approximately an 8% difference, non-significant difference, but Anyway, there was a difference between um, the immediate carbohydrate and the delayed carbohydrate groups. One of the criticisms I could have here is that it was only nine people, so it's maybe difficult to actually find differences between groups. I know it's a randomized crossover trial, so it's probably still a good way to do this, but nine people in this case might just have been not enough to see any significant differences there. But according to the authors, there were no, let's say, differences between glycogen recovery between the groups. Good, but what happened with performance? Because that's, at the end, still the most interesting parameter, right? And there we see some very interesting things happening. Because as I said, they did this crazy test where you do intervals until exhaustion, right? An EMOM to exhaustion or an e 2 mom to exhaustion. And exactly what they did, you see here that the immediate carbohydrate group did approximately 17 of those intervals until exhaustion. And the delayed carbohydrate group actually had a significant lower amount of reps they can do or intervals they can do. So maybe their glycogen was, let's say, similarly recovered in the delayed 
way of uh, eating carbohydrates, but their next day performance was 30% less, which is very substantial. And then there's also an, a cool chart on the other side where they looked at the rate of perceived exertion at different intervals, right? And here you see that certainly in the beginning, when they start doing those intervals, the rate of perceived exertion after every interval was actually higher with the delayed carbohydrate condition. At the end, the final one, obviously it was the same because that should be 10, should be the maximal amount of RPE. So our RPE, for just for your remembrance, is a scale from 1 to 10 on how hard the effort has been, right? 1 being nothing, 10 being the hardest thing you've ever done. So they did less reps after the delayed carbohydrate condition, and they were also, yeah, they felt less comfortable from the get-go of those uh, intervals. Very interesting findings, in my opinion, and very applicable to high-intensity sports like uh, CrossFit, High Rocks, and so on, because I see many people just delaying their carbohydrates after very hard sessions, because those sessions in, for example, CrossFit are very much relatable to the protocol they use here, high-intensity interval training, and so on. So this shows that it might be a great idea to not really force yourself, but put your carbohydrate snack or your drink right after exercise, put it available for you and have a couple of sips so you actually can already ignite that glycogen resynthesis for the next day, for the next couple of days to enhance your recovery. Because we all know that recovery is a vital part of any training plan. Take home, if you look at the biochemistry, that right after exercise, right, like right after high intensity exercise, your muscles are, let's say, more open to store the glycogen. So it's like, yes, I have been doing all those contractions, muscle contractions, I need to recover fast, so give me all the glucose. That's literally what's happening on a biochemical way, on a biochemical standard in your body. And that is because these GLUT4 transporters are independently triggered by exercise, by calcium, by calcium signaling, and so on, compared to uh, by, by insulin or by slower systems. And then delaying carbohydrates right after exercises negatively pretty substantially uh, affect your high intensity uh, performance for the next day. Is this fully related to glycogen and carbohydrates? That's debatable. That's not really shown in this study. And potentially other signaling mechanisms, maybe brain mechanisms uh, are there that this study didn't look into, but maybe is subject for future studies for sure. That was it uh, for me today. Please leave a like and also subscribe to the channel if you like this kind of nerdy, sciencey content. We definitely love this and we hope to also improve your own training, how you look at training and how you're able to coach athletes, for example. If you're interested in our training plans, just check the first link in the description. Um, we get a lot of good feedback from people who say, finally some programming where there's no over-programming. I feel like I can recover between the sessions and actually improve over time. And that's really our goal with our evidence-based programming. Cool. If you want to learn more on how we see programming for functional fitness, CrossFit, as well as High Rocks, just click the video that is popping up right now. See you in the next one. Ciao.